Hi, I'm Rajiv, and I'm a calligrapher living in New York City, but I like to do a lot of other things. Some of those things have taken me to incredible, unexpected places, and today I'm here at one of my favorite places, Guy Wolf Pottery in Litchfield, Connecticut. He loves that motorcycle. I'm not exaggerating. That is the love of his life. <laughs> Just film that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Slow that wheel down. Slow the wheel down. I can't believe it. You're throwing like a second grader. <laughs> Who told you to throw like that? <laughs> you want me to center it for you? What? Slow the wheel down. In 2009, I got my <laughs> monthly issue of Martha Stewart Living. I was in my final year of college, and this wonderful potter was in the magazine making flower pots for Martha. And I had been, at that point, I had been working on the pottery wheel at school for about 10 years. And I read about you, and I just knew right away <laughs> I have to I have to meet this man and I want to learn from this man. So I called Guy on the telephone and I said, "Can I come and apprentice with you?" And Guy very politely declined and said, "No." no. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> so I I had to try something else and I wrote him a letter and um, Didn't I, I said no thanks, right? You said you see you we were <laughs> guy was very polite about saying no. No, but you have to understand, most people when they get a letter, it doesn't look like it's from a friend of D Darcy or Elizabeth Bennett or I mean it was an 18th century scroll with this incredible line. And as a potter, I'm going, okay, there's 20 years of hard work to be able to make that lettering. Anybody that can do that is in the business, we have the word handy. So somebody that is able to write a letter like that right away is usable, is trainable, and is worth the space they're gonna take up. So every summer that I've come up here, we've made flower pots, but this year, Guy was telling me about making stoneware, and I really uh, was excited to be a part of it. And that is what this last month has been about making and firing stoneware. So for you, Guy, this is something that you do once a year, twice a year? It depends on the year. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes not at all. When we were having this conversation over coffee, it became clear to me that this was something that's sentimental to you, right? No, well, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, I would call this, uh, without getting pompous about it, when this works, this mm -hmm. is high art. Mm -hmm. So the flower pots are houses for something beautiful to be in. Even at the classiest form, they're kind of making a, a picture frame mm -hmm. and the plants inside are the, are the art. Th they're, they're secondary actors and, and the, the soliloquy is coming from the plant. Yep. So these are, they're powerful, you know. Guy said to me repeatedly, you have to think that this is going to be around for 2,000 years. 2,000 years. Because unlike a flower pot that, you know, you can try to keep it for a while, but if it cracks after two or three years, well, you got its use out of it. And these are made with the intention of being... Cherished. Cherished, yeah, for, for long after you and I are gone. And I, I never really looked at it that way. You know, I'm looking at it as, let's have fun, let's make pots. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how does that affect what you're doing? Well, I just take it very, very seriously. So when I'm making a flower pot, I've really thought about what the shape is before I make it. Mm -hmm. When I'm making these, it's a conversation. <laughs> 
started throwing in 66. I made that my junior year. That that was the, you know, the summer of love or whatever, 1969. 1969 you made this? Yeah. Then from 1969, I opened up my shop after I came back from Wales in 1971. So this is from the first year of making. So this was kind of my first signature was to do ribbing on clay. The moving of the material is showing in that. So. I wanted the glaze to be a natural, simple material that let the throwing show, the activity of the throwing. And it really does, you see everything. This little grouping here is uh, 1979. You'll notice the handle's on a 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. which is 12th, 13th century. You know, you have bed and board, and a board would be food on a board or a drink on a board. The barmaid would pull it off not hitting the next one. Oh, we hand it to someone. So for passing a mug, they were put on, on an angle from each other. The batch of pottery that's over here, these are all salt clays. And the cool thing about salt clays is you get up to the temperature that we're going to see in our furnace here, and at the last minute, you throw salt into the furnace, which volatilizes into a cloud of glass. And the glass, connects with the pot. That's why you can do all these refined work on here. Did you do this bird? Yeah. We do a bird like this in, in a calligraphy flourish. It's yeah. like something from the 18th century. Well, the thing about this, if a bird is looking away from itself, it stands for good luck because they're not protecting themselves. Oh. I love that there's a story behind these and it's they, not just a yeah. bird. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's, there's power and imagery. Anybody who is creating stuff, the one message is a 70 year old guy who's been 50 years in a trade, the material that you're working for, you, you hope for it the best that its essence is. And if you can stay on that mindset, the material responds. Guys always telling me that when I'm here or reminding me I should say, uh, you have to respond to the material of the clay. Hey, you want this one? That's what an apprentice is for. There you go, bro. I'm gonna do just a little bit. What, it wasn't good enough? I just wanna feel the clay. So clay is made out of platelets of glass. Platelets of glass are long and thin. So you wanna get them so that they're all going in the same direction. So basically, when you're talking about using a wheel, the thing that makes it uh, incredibly exciting is it's basically the laws of architecture in motion. So a pot can have an arch, it can have a straight, or it can have a dome. There's nuance in the form. Now I'm pushing in from the outside and I'm pushing out from the inside. And the activity between those two things is what's making the clay rise. I'm gonna be making a bottle, so I'm just gonna close this in a little bit. So that flat tool that Guy's using right now is called a rib. So the rib to, is to the potter exactly what a violin bow is for a fiddle player. This amplifies those things I talked about, the arches, straights, and domes. Do you know where the shillelagh is? Yeah. I have the shillelagh. <laughs> we made a tool for Rajiv for working on the inside of the bottle. And it's just if you want to get inside the pot and see how there's this little dent here. I want to get that just to come up a little your, bit. Your hand won't fit inside. So this thing is a useful little tool. Guy makes so many of his own tools. And that has been a fascinating thing to see over the years. He needs just the right thing for it. Well, he runs down to the basement where there are a bunch of power tools and he makes what he needs. Beautiful. <laughs> Guy Wolf does it again. <laughs> so my daughter really wanted to do some decorating on stoneware. I knew Rajiv would be an interesting person to do decorating on stoneware. And I just thought the catalyst of the community of 
Elizabeth, who's been decorating for years, and Rajiv, who has this re refined and you know practiced practiced hand. Um, between it all, I knew we could get to something that was uh, past a contrived copy of some old pottery. I just I knew we could do something exciting. So I just I should just say that Lizzie has so many years of drawing. She makes these beautiful pierced tin lamps, and she's been doing this for years. And she she just makes it look so simple, but it is very difficult to create a fluid line with something like this. Well, to, um, yeah. I mean, imagine you're doing you're, you're drawing with ketchup. Yeah. It's a ketchup bottle. I was watching you just throw these strokes. Yeah. And this is where it's like calligraphy. Once the nib is on the page, you have to it's commit. It's not coming back, yeah. And you can't stop and think about it when you're doing it. You have to just go. Yeah. And you have to just go with what the piece of pottery tells you. And then, you know, once I get to here, I have to think about where do I let the space breathe? I'm gonna leave an open space so that you can, you know, it's a valley. So I am very, very new at decorating pots. Uh, this is something that Guy proposed I start doing just in the last month. And knowing when to stop, I am learning is vital to making the decoration actually harmonious with the shape of the pot. Um, my early attempts at doing this, I just kind of was having so much fun, I just kept going and it looks like wallpaper on the pot not being conscious of the actual shape of the thing and watching Lizzie work and being critiqued by the masters. <laughs> I see that I often just go too far. Negative space. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do now on this vase is I'm gonna put some stripes on it and that technique is called banding. I had never banded anything before up until about a month ago and Guy walked me through how to do it. We have cobalt over here and we have some brushes and we put it on the wheel and we start the wheel very slowly and then dip the brush in and carefully hold the brush still while the pot goes around. In theory, makes sense. So I did it and there were some places where the brush kind of missed the pot and I thought, well, I'll just take another brush and kind of fill it in, fill in the spots I didn't get, thinking that I did a decent job and Guy came over and was like, no, this is wrong. <laughs> this, is, this is not how it's done. You have to put this on with confidence because everyone can see it and it was pretty amazing that when he said that and I stepped away from it, I totally saw what he meant. You either commit or you don't do it. You put the stripe on and you put it on properly or you don't put a stripe on. And that is something that I love about this whole process is that there is, there's such a philosophy behind something as simple as a stripe. Having Guy point out that it's very important to consider where the stripe is going and how the stripe is a mark on the shape that's emphasizing the shape or pointing the shape out. Um, that blew my mind. Coming here and being given the opportunity to actually paint with cobalt onto porcelain, I just kind of dove right in. I looked at some images of of pieces from the 14 or 1500s and I was copying them. And I thought I was doing a really good job. <laughs> but I wasn't paying attention at all to the shape of the pot. And Guy really pointed out that what those early artists were doing, they were speaking to the shape of the pot through the painting. Um, and the, the, every line that's created, every curve, is in relation to the silhouette of the actual pot. So I still am diving right in and I'm trying. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes I'll pull a stroke and I'll know that it's not right. But um, you just kinda 
you have to go for it. And, and as is the case with what Lizzie's doing over there, I know that once my brush makes contact with the pot, I can't hesitate. I have to move. Um, and there's something thrilling about that. Cobalt. There is this pressure. There's this pressure of, it's really nice clay. I took so much time and care. You know, even, even when the painting's done, that's, it's not out of danger. So there is this subconscious thing that's always in my head. Is it in your head too? Constantly? Uh, yeah, of um, am, I going to am I going to ruin this right now? It is a lot of fun though, I have, I have to say. Yes. As nerve wracking as it can be, it, it's very gratifying. When those pieces come out of the kiln, it's thrilling. Mm hmm Yeah. Sweet dreams of you. We don't have the rights to that song. <laughs> so the last step of the process is glazing the pieces before they get fired. And this might seem really simple, but it is actually delicate and uh, I'm not allowed to do it yet. <laughs> Basically, it's just clay and glass suspended in water. There's probably six hours of work between these three glazes sitting here of just making sure that it's running and not bumpy. You can't make it too thick. A lot of this feels a lot like a chef. Because it's liquid, it has to be fast. This is called True Albany River Slip. It, it's dug out of Albany, New York. This right now looks as though all that beautiful decoration has been covered. But after this has been fired, it will be transparent and the decoration that's under this will be visible through Correct. the glaze. And just to say one last time, if you're lucky, this pot's going to be around for 2,000 years. So I want to ask you just, just about temperature. Um, this compared to this, this is a flower pot that this is a pot that guy would make in here regularly and this is a porcelain pot. What's the temperature that this so is fired at? More importantly, yep. this I mean, we'll talk temperature, but so this is 2000 degrees. This is 2345. 345 degrees, you wouldn't think was much. This is a low yellow heat. This is a white heat. It takes almost the same amount of energy that it took to get to 2,000 degrees, again, to get to 2,300 degrees. In other words, you could use 40 gallons of propane to get to 2,000 degrees, and you need 80 gallons of propane to get up that 300 more degrees. Really? Yeah, so it's a quarter of a million BTUs an hour times 18 hours. Wow. So this is, this is a, a lot of energy to make it happen. See, what's happening is the flames coming in from this side of the kill. Mm -hmm. And we wanna set the pot so that they uh, are going to be hit by the flame. Uh, and the flame is going to go over them, hit the top of the arch, and then go down to what we call the fire trough and out, out to the flue. So the heat's circulating around the whole thing? Yeah. And I think of it sort of like it's water, like hydraulics. Yeah. Where the flame comes in, there has to be the same volume for the flame to be able to go out. A live flame, there's a lot of things that can go on. If there's humidity in the air, there's less oxygen. If the air has barometric pressure, mm -hmm. things can't go out the chimney as fast. Uh, if the wind is blowing, uh, you can slow down the amount of heat as it's going out. So 
the flame is made from fuel plus oxygen. So if you have an oxidized flame, you'll get a clean surface as the clay is melting. If you have smoke in the kill, this is a blue, but it's still, it's sort of purpley because it got attacked by smoke and a little bit of copper from a pot that was nearby it. But the wind was blowing and it was smoky and this was on a cleaner day. So same clay, same, same. cobalt underneath, yep. same glaze, and really the weather and the elements changed what this looked like, which is what's so fascinating about this, is that for thousands of years, potters have looked to the weather before lighting that kiln, right? Yes, so a nice customer comes in the shop and says, uh, I'd like 20 of these. When you're doing stoneware, the answer is, <laughs> <laughs> So it's been kicking since 11 o'clock in the morning, say uh, a quarter of a million BTUs an hour. So the propane company is very happy with us. That's the hottest thing you're ever going to see without looking at the sun. I guess the word would be awe-inspiring. <laughs> this morning, um, lighting that kiln and hearing within the first 15 minutes things explode. <laughs> things that we have been working on for a week and we have been exhausted at the end of every day. It should not have happened. But it did. And, <laughs> and there is something, but in every sense of the word, exciting. Here's the thing, when we had this initial conversation about stoneware firing in the backyard and, and what it means to you, what excited me was the process of loading up this kiln full of these wares that you love, closing the door and knowing as a potter that for many thousands of years, the person doing that has stood in front of that pinnacle. Yes, and has closed the door and known that the wind and the air and the fire is now in control. Okay. 15 hours of fire going into the kiln, and now we have come to the end. <laughs> Who knows what we got? Who knows what we got? Right now, Guy has taken out the burners, and he's gonna cover up the holes to keep that heat in there, to allow it to cool gradually without all this cold air going in there and shocking so the internal temperature. This is hot enough to take away somebody's arm. So what you do is, is you just, you're very respectful of that amount of heat. And then you say good night. Good night. Good night, sweetheart. There were a few tears shed yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> there was no swearing. No swearing at all. Just, just crying. There was a lot of swearing. <laughs> <laughs> no. This was such a special firing to me. I thought, okay, I'm going to use materials that I've been saving for 40 years. And there was some very special English china clay that I thought I was using. I thought I was using one thing and I was using something else. So, so out know. of so out of all, out of our yield, out of a hundred percent yield of what we put in there, what do you think was the percentage of of stuff that survived? Conservatively, it was somewhere between fifteen to twenty-five percent. I happen to be here for, for the biggest disaster in fifty years, <laughs> which you know that makes good theater too. Yeah, you know? these are our, a treasure for us because you know? these are the ones that survived. Uh, when I see these pieces you know, that vase is worth it. This was sitting at the very back in a little corner. The fact that this is unscathed um, from quite, quite a wreckage in there, that does, to me, it makes it all the more special. We're going to be doing more. And uh, the, to end, the best thing to say is have a look at what 
Rajiv made today. These are gonna be trimmed and dried and these are gonna go back into that kiln. We're just gonna keep going. We're gonna keep making beautiful things. So, Yay. thank you. One, two, three, one, two. I'm going away to leave you, love. I'm going away for a while. But I'll return to you someday if I go 10,000 miles. The storms are on the ocean. The heavens may cease to be. The, the, the infuriating thing is if, if you counted up the hours a year that Rajiv is throwing, it's hours, it's not months, it's not, you know, and, and the fact that he can make that is really just infuriating. <laughs> it's like, this guy starts making these Sung Dynasty bowls, and I'm just going, how, how is that happening? You can't. You can't do that. <laughs> Most of the videos that are out about Guy, they're like, they're so formal and they're refined. It's for like a gardening crowd or Martha Stewart audience. And very little people know that the most common voice that Guy does in here with me is Miss Piggy. <laughs> when he's talking, he gets, it just very often goes to Miss Piggy. What a beautiful, expensive bowl. this video give it a thumbs up and if you didn't like this video give it a thumbs down <laughs> but either way please subscribe for more videos just like this one my hat fell off Beautiful. Do you want one of these? No. <laughs> Marie Kondo would say no. <laughs> Let it go.